he was uh, he was named Bishop of Monterey, uh, California Diocese uh, by Pope Francis, and the installation was last week, and he invited me to come. And I want you to know there were three cardinals there. I don't know how many bishops and archbishops. It was. It was an amazing event, and I'll bet you there were 200 people from Austin, Texas there. That he came, of course, from that diocese. Priests and parishioners from a former parish. I love the guy, but he is obviously well loved. Oh my goodness. And I was invited to every part of it. The Song of Vespers uh, was in, the, in a mission church from, I can't remember whether it's 17th century, I th I'm almost positive it was, see the missionaries came to the Southwest before they came to the United States, or any part of the United States. So, uh, St. Junipero Serra, founded that uh, the churches in that area. This is one of the churches uh, that he built. And his, uh, when he was, um, when he was um, canonized, couldn't think of the word, when he was canonized, Pope Francis had a crucifix minted in silver with a relic from St. Lippero in the crucifix. And uh, for the solemn vespers, as Bishop Danny came to the door, someone held that crucifix for him to kiss. That was the beginning of the solemn vespers. And then, uh, he was, uh, uh, I've forgotten who was presiding at the point, but uh, he was uh, at a renewal of baptism. Then all the people in uh, the processional renewal of baptism, I mean, and it was like almost no mass I've ever been to. Everything was up a notch. Every voice was operatic quality. And we chanted uh, everything. I mean, there was nothing read except the readings. Prayers, the songs, everything was chanted. This, uh, this was held in Monterey. Uh, as I say, in the, in the mission church. And you had to be invited because that probably is a, it's not all that much, maybe twice as big as our chapel. But you see what I mean, it's really small. And so most of the people who came and who uh, were not invited to that. And uh, then there was a reception after that. Uh, then the next day, the installation was held in Salinas, which is about 30 minutes away. And I was, I didn't think about this until afterwards, but I was invited to the luncheon before the installation. There couldn't have been more than 60 people maybe there. So everything that happened, I felt more and more honored that he would include me in all this. And uh, there, uh, another person who was there was the uh, president of the National Council of Catholic Bishops. I mean, I, we had dignitaries all over the place. <laughs> no, 
Uh, he sent just one ticket. <laughs> and uh, then uh, he had told me to vest. So I was in Albert Stoll, and there was a place for the deacons, and there were quite a number of deacons. Uh, most were local, but there were a few from Austin. I was the only one from Iowa. <laughs> And uh, they, of course, were asking me how, how it was that I was a deacon from Iowa would be invited. <laughs> and they were so warm and gracious, and, and the priests were also. And, uh, of course, we processed in, and I thought the solemn vespers was wonderful. This was even another night about that. There was a... a uh, an orchestra, and there had to be, I'd say, 75 or 100 people in the choir. An example of the kinds of things they did, they, it was a, an extensively printed uh, program. And uh, again, you had to have a ticket to get into the church and there were lots and lots and lots of people who came who couldn't get into the church. And uh, they, prayer for the prayer the faithful, right? again, everything was sung except the readings. And uh, at the prayer of the faithful, every one of the petitions was sung in a different language. Spanish, Korean, Vietnamese, uh, what is the language of the Hmong people? Uh, Tala, something like that. Anyway, just a whole. And we see in English out to the side of the program that was uh, the English translation. But, and the people who attended sang. So that it was just, I mean, I told Father Jim, thought I was in heaven already. <laughs> and he said, hold on here, I just lost another friend last week. <laughs> but it was glorious, seriously. I, it is something I will always remember. Then the reception, I could not even get near him. The line of people wanting to greet him and speak to him and have a picture taken with him extended all throughout this hall, all of the way out and out the door. And I waited for quite a while and couldn't get near him. So I thought, well, I can at least take a picture of him with all these people. He saw me. He said, come here, John. He interrupted the line. Had to come over and had somebody take uh, take our picture together. Oh, no. it's, oh, Do you have it? I, yes. You would love to see it. <laughs> yes. The first thing I thought of it. I hadn't shown it to anybody. My wife oh, said, you keep right. telling this, show people. <laughs> 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 but uh, so were you there when we were in the deep cold <laughs> And I have to tell you, the weather was very nice. But remember, I came back. To it? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh, well, it's, uh, I think if you touch, I think you can see us even. But, wow, that's a great picture. It is. Wow, lucky you. That is cool. But the uh, uh, diocesan logo is in, that's what's in the background. 
And uh, all the deacons wore a diocesan stole for the logo. I have a brand new stole with a logo of the Archdiocese of Dubuque on it. And wore it uh, for the first time. So it was, and of course people were asking me about that too. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I missed you, but not much. <laughs> uh, while that's going around, I'll say, you know, uh, all the, all the way home I was thinking, I don't know whether there will be any. Oh. Hey, Grandpa, just I'm going to do sure. this. Because we're don't. talking about it. Oh. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, oh, my, oh, my, oh my God. Well, first of all, I didn't know whether the, there would be a flight into uh, Des Moines or not because of the weather. Well, uh, I called and everything was in order. So the airport, and, you know, everything went. Uh, I barely got the connection, though, because... Uh, but I did, and I kept thinking, will I be able to get my car out of that place? Because I knew it was going to be snowed in and you know, frozen in, probably. Battery problem, possibly, too. That was a possibility. I want you to know, the Spirit of God was still with me. <laughs> it couldn't have been any easier to get out. It was like nothing. <laughs> and so, and I didn't even get cold, and all I had on was a, um, the, I had on a sweater and a shirt, and uh, my sport, well, the coat to my suit, and my overcoat, which is not uh, terribly heavy. And I thought, I'm going to freeze. I didn't. So, I tell you, this the whole thing was just one long spiritual experience. <laughs> you were burning with it. Yeah. Right. Oh, <laughs> burning with it. Oh my, it was it was great. So, uh, shall we turn to? Yes. I just want to say, since um, there's some new people here, um, I have a link for this YouTube, and I would like to make sure that if we can share with each other, or somehow it needs to get out to new people. I got her email, but if there's anyone else that I'm missing that's new. They might like to have this because they might not be able to make every session. Okay. So um, send me an email or send it to John. He'll send it to me. I don't know. Let's see. Can, can, I, can I make you this copy? Yeah, that'd be great. And uh, okay. Those are everyone new. Yeah, this okay. is everyone. So I'll make you a copy of this. Oh, I can just take a picture of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> She's super modern. <laughs> <laughs> well, that'll take care of that. Yeah. Here we are. Thank you. My response reminds me of my aunt's response when her husband shot, when my uncle shot himself. Uh, she forgot she had a telephone, <laughs> <laughs> ran all the way to the neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm still back a few years. <laughs> uh, so we start at. Uh, Luke 8, uh, verse 22, but before we do the reading, I'd like you to look over, especially look over chapter 7 and the first part of 8. So just get some sense of where we have been, because in all of this, one of the important questions has been, and who who is Jesus? Because, you know, it's, again, we've been getting different responses. Uh, people don't know what to make of him. The apostles themselves, uh, well, they're not apostles yet. The disciples clearly don't understand. So, just look over, especially chapter 7 and 8 up to 22. 
<clears throat> Did we go through all the parables the last time we met? Uh, we we went to uh, twenty through twenty one eight twenty one. Maybe I wasn't here. Uh, am I correct? Yes, that's oh, what we were supposed to say. That's you know, I thought this. I was wondering um, about the whole fasting thing that people should do for Lent, and you know if yes. you have some knowledge about how that works. Because I really haven't never seen anything that says, well, okay, fish on Friday, I know that. But uh, Okay, first of all, uh, fish is not meat. <clears throat> okay. And I think most people have not connected that with the fasting. Notice, fish is appropriate to eat. Seafood, right? Because that is not regarded as meat. And so in what respect and honor of our Lord who gave his flesh and blood on the cross and then gives it to us in the Eucharist it's a way of honoring and celebrating the gift, both of us, in the sense of our salvation on the cross, and he nourishes us with his body, flesh, and blood. Am I responding? Mm -hmm. So that's what you do. So what? So we can have fish, whatever through this season? Are we just supposed to have, like I know Muslims have to have food after it gets dark? There is no time set. Uh, the recommendation <coughs> is that we have light meals on uh, uh, Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Right. But uh, that's not to lose weight, okay? <laughs> there's, an age limit, there's an age limit, 59 and a half, if you're beyond that, you don't have to worry about the fasting well, uh, of it. some of us Still say, do. yeah, it, it's if you're sick, or uh, in, I guess I'd say, infirm with age, or if you want to use the age, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. But uh, uh, notice, there's nothing wrong with continuing to uh, observe Good Friday, Fridays. Uh, th that is still recommended, even if not regarded as a, what, obligation, requirement, whatever you would call it. Uh, am I responding? Mm -hmm. Is there any, any of Do we know how long those regulations have been in our church history? I don't, but I do know <clears throat> that uh, fasting came very early and uh, early on they fasted for 40 days. Uh, and fasting was again not totally without food obviously, but the penitential practices from the early church were rigorous because this is something new. This, <clears throat> this Christ religion. Uh, and uh, so I know that it was renewed, the rigor was renewed in the 12th century, but it was not begun then. The German monks made beer because they they drank their they drank their uh, I guess they enjoyed the their fasting, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like one meal a day or a well, light meal. It's a, it's a uh, three light meals. Yeah, three light meals. Or two uh -huh. light meals and one. Or just meal. lots of salad. Uh, two light meals okay. and one normal one is what is this is what comes out from the. Uh, bishops. So, but there is um, something to not eating too. It's healing not to eat food. 
at all as well. Right? Well, uh, that, but that's not that's not even recommended. That's certainly mm -hmm. appropriate, but not even recommended. Yeah. 40 days, a long time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I never thought about it, <clears throat> but the fact that fish was probably a standard food in Jesus' time. And so it's, it's ironic, isn't it, that that's the food that we're asked to eat on, on a Friday. And you'd think that they would have said, you know, that was common for them. So well, why yeah. would they but choose fish? Yeah. Even the poor could have fish. Yeah. Okay. Because... Uh, it, it isn't as if you had to raise it. Red meat was a luxury. <laughs> and red meat was indeed a luxury. Uh, so wouldn't you think they would have chosen that you could eat red meat on Friday? However, <laughs> however uh, <coughs> they did and do in that area eat birds. So uh, birds Chicken. would be meat. So. Mm -hmm. uh, you would not eat, eat uh, meat. You know, this... They got quail this, in the desert, so that would be... Yeah. This... Uh, <clears throat> Spanish has really helped me to sort of connect because in Spanish, it's meat and blood. And that really makes it sort of... It drives it home in a way that I would, we would never say uh, Jesus gives us his meat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's. Uh, so, I suppose on those Fridays you couldn't eat whale fish or whale flesh then, could you? A quail? Quail is a mammal. Quail's a, a bird. Quail? Uh, a whale? Quail? A whale. Whale. Oh, whale? Who's, go, who's going to get a uh, whale out of that area? I don't know. I don't think so. Because uh, Mediterra Mediterranean Sea, I, I suppose there yeah. might be. But now this. But they're mammals. Yeah. Does that. But uh, they did, the classifications were totally different. Uh, by the way, the. Uh, People of the Bible and for a long, long time uh, would not, they would not have eaten whale no matter what because a whale was seen as a symbol of the devil. A Leviathan. Leviathan from the Old Testament. The whale was Leviathan. <coughs> And Jonah didn't like being in the belly, then, did he? That's right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, by the way, do you know what Jonah, uh, what the book of Jonah says about Jonah's prayer, where he was when he asked, when he prayed to God? We say he was in the, what, belly of the fish? The text says, he lifted up his voice from the depths of Sheol. Oh. What is Sheol? Yeah. Hebrew, the place of the dead. <clears throat> so, the place of the dead, not necessarily hell. Uh, though it, I, have I told you how the word, those words came to be understood? Let me do it real quickly. This is Hebrew, Greek, and English, Scandinavian, Germanic. Indo-European, I suppose, would be the, the term. All of them originally meant simply the grave, the place of the dead. All three. In time, each of these, notice I didn't say this one, although possibly this one, 
but for sure these two came to be understood as a sort of a shadowy uh, place that was where the <coughs> dead were, but it's, it wasn't our understanding of hell, it wasn't purgatory, it was... It was just an afterlife. It was an afterlife kind of a thing. Uh, and uh, thanks, well said, Julie. Okay, and so these remained that way. Hell, in Christian tradition, came to be understood as, in the uh, Spanish, infierno. Uh, do you know what that is in Spanish? Inferno. Inferno. <clears throat> And uh, so, when uh, the creed says he descended into hell, big discussion and even argument among theologians. Does that mean this or this? And that is not settled <coughs> within it. There has been no, shall I say, there's been no definitive statement. Clarification. Mm -hmm. Clarification mm -hmm. about whether it's hell or the place of the dead. So if uh, hell is either English or Germanic in or European <coughs> in origin at the time of Christ, it would have been Sheol or Hades, mm -hmm. right? Correct. So it would have been understood that he Hell to the afterlife? Or not, not necessarily even an afterlife, but maybe. Uh, so I think, I think that's <clears throat> worth knowing because it's, it's uh, especially since we still use that in the uh, creed, he descended into hell on the third day he rose again. Now, there's all the Roman word. Pardon? Latin word and Roman word. Hell? What was Roman? What was the Roman term? Oh, uh, what is the Latin term? <coughs> Probably inferno. But that may have been why we digressed into the. Uh, and, well, and then you got the story Gehenna. of Saint Michael. And you got Gehenna, yeah. which is germ, uh, which is uh, Greek. There's also this uh, in some of the. Somewhat later, well, the Gospel according to Nicodemus, <clears throat> which is a second, uh, second century, quote, gospel, unquote, is an elaborate story about <clears throat> Jesus descending <clears throat> into hell, and it's called the harrowing. Do you know what a harrow is? It's, it's a, a farm. Breaking up soil, right? Yeah. Yeah. Breaking up soil. To drag over the soil, to yeah. break yeah. up the clumps, clods. And yeah. Okay. The harrowing of hell. And you have uh, uh, stories of uh, Satan saying, What is this light? And Withdrawing from hell and fear, drawing back in fear. It's, it's very graphic. So that, <clears throat> that uh, story came into, um, into Western tradition and some of them, uh, I'd say the beautiful uh, uh, illuminated manuscripts with the, you know, the mm -hmm. elaborate illuminations. Oh boy, the, the harrowing of hell, you have a bright red, and it's used lots of reds and yellows, and Satan's eyes are always flashing fire. But remember, in Revelation, Jesus' eyes flash fire. Here's, I'll mention that another concept in Christian tradition. Does it actually say fire or is it more light that he's flashing? Uh, 
thick, it looks like fire, light, but uh, I think it says fire in Revelation. I should check that, but a uh, concept is very, very old Christian concept probably came from Judaism, like so many of these things do. Every image has its mirror image. Okay, what's a mirror image? It's not a reflection of what you really look like. It's the opposite. Yeah, it's the opposite. So, of course, Satan and Jesus would have flashing eyes. Uh, in other words, the, that teaching came with a warning. How can you discern whether it's from God or from the devil? They can look just alike. If it brings peace from God. and serenity, then it's from God. That was the teaching about how to discern spirits. Mm -hmm. If it brings chaos. chaos, conflict, hatred, then it's from the devil. Well, he had some sort of dream like Joseph did, and I heard the voices. <clears throat> but that would that is not the norm. So the the church gave us a teaching on how any any of us can discern spirits. Even if the voice did the same thing that you know brought chaos or peace, then you would try to be able to discern it properly. Uh, in fact. A dream can be just as much from one spirit as another. So all dreams are not uh, visions, shall I say. Or maybe all visions are not holy. Am I responding? I hope I'm not muddying the water, uh, but clarifying. Well, yeah, because um, I heard that the satanic rituals and that sort of stuff go on quite a bit during the Easter season, especially Good Friday. I don't know if there's some significance to why they think that that would, you know, be, oh, you know, uh, they, they, It makes sense that any, uh, anything that is in opposition to the faith would occur on those special celebrations of the faith. <clears throat> And, uh, uh, you know, Christianity, in the West anyway, is the norm, fair enough? Mm -hmm. And uh, whether, you, whether you believe it or whether you follow it or not, it's regarded as the norm. So, uh, any opposition to the norm is going to take place on those special celebrations. Any other comment or question? <laughs> Have you had a chance to look over chapter 7 and 8? Chapter 7, <clears throat> then we'll start at uh, verse 20, what does that say, 22? Thank you. Tell you what, I think I'll just go through this and remind you real quickly. Uh, chapter 7, now all of this is in Galilee. And Galilee is not, the, what? Not Judea. It's not Judea. Uh, Galilee is not a Jewish area. 
And of course, Jesus was born outside the Jewish area. Uh, not born, raised. He was born in Bethlehem. That is in Judea. But he was it, uh, raised in Nazareth. That is outside the Jewish area. There were Jews there, but uh, that was not regarded as the Jewish area. In fact, uh, we're going to see this uh, in what we read, but when Jews entered Judea from any other area, do you know what they did? They shook the dust off their feet. And um, they often did that on entering the temple, too. So, the chapter 7, all of this, as I say, is in Judea. Uh, chapter 7 begins with the story of the uh, centurion servant and a centurion. Do you know what a centurion is? Roman office. Roman office uh, over a hundred people. And notice this particular centurion went to Jewish elders to ask them to uh, make the request of Jesus. Now, that would suggest that he is what the book of Acts particularly calls a God-fearer. A what? God-fearer. God that was the term used for Gentiles who accepted the uh, what Jewish faith, but not they were not converts. Conversion was illegal according to Roman law. So while not converts, they were God fearers and were allowed to worship in the synagogue. And so this is a well thought of centurion. All right, the next thing that uh, you have here is uh, the healing of the uh, healing, the raising of the young man to his mother. Remember the, the widow of Nain? She's a widow with an only son. And I told you, remember? They keep saying, who is this? And look at verse 6 of uh, chapter 7. A great prophet has arisen up, risen among us. Okay, then the coming of John's disciples, and what do they ask? Are you... Are you the one, or are we to wait for another? What does Jesus answer? Look at what's happening in the yeah. go back and report. The blind, uh, blind have sight, the lame walk, and so on. You know what Jesus is paraphrasing? Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah, which says, uh, speaks of the light to the Gentiles and the blind will see and so on. So the prophet Isaiah, Jesus is quoting, or uh, it seems more like a paraphrase than a quotation here. Um, okay, uh, then the next thing you have is uh, Jesus' comment on John the Baptist. And uh, he says, John the Baptist is my messenger from what prophet? Elijah. It, it, um, it's, well, it's not from, it's from, it is Elijah. My messenger <clears throat> is referred to as Elijah. This is from Malachi, the prophet Malachi, chapter 3. When it goes, Behold, I send my messenger before you who will prepare the way. And uh, Jesus says that refers to whom? John. John the Baptist, yeah. And notice then again, 
uh, Jesus is talking about the people. Uh, they they uh, criticize John and they criticize him. What did they criticize John for? Fasting. Not fasting. And they called Jesus a glutton. <laughs> so, no way to please this crowd. <laughs> <laughs> All right, then uh, Jesus is in the home of a Pharisee, <clears throat> having dinner with a Pharisee, and something very shocking happens. What? A sinful woman comes and not only touches him, which will be absolutely Oh my word. Uh, and she washes his feet with her tears, anoints his feet, and uh, dries his feet with her hair, right? That was not his house, did not wash his feet. What? The host did not wash his feet. And he said, and when they're having all these thoughts, that he must not, he must not be a prophet because he doesn't. If he did, he would know who was touching him. Who's, uh, and uh, so Jesus says, when I entered your home, you did not offer me water to wash my feet. What would normally be done, any host would not just offer water, but a servant in the house would wash the person's feet. He said, you offered me no water to wash my feet. You did not anoint my head. That would be done to a special, some special occasion. She anointed my feet. And he goes on to expand on that. And notice the one who loves much is forgiven much. The one who loves little is forgiven a little. Okay. Uh, now, uh, notice what does he say to this woman? Your sins are forgiven. And then he says, your faith has saved you. You're going to hear this again. Your faith has saved you. Now, we tend to talk about uh, our soul, save our souls, right? That is not a, uh, if, if we think of soul as opposed to body, that's not Christian. It's not Jewish. In Jewish and Christian tradition, we are souls with a body. We're not bodies that have a soul. Major difference. In Greek tradition, the soul was imprisoned in the body. And so, you have a soul, you see. In Jewish and Christian tradition, you are a soul, and you have a body. Okay, so notice, your faith has saved you. What does that mean? Your sins are forgiven. And you're going to see it used in other ways as well. Your faith has healed you, might be a way of saying it. And what is the healing? The total person. Uh, we tend to divide people up. English is a, uh, an analytical language. We take things apart. Greek and Hebrew and Latin are synthetic languages. They put things together and hold things together. So to say, uh, think of Okay, salve. what's a salve? Salve. Anointment. 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 Anoint
How about salvation? Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. If we start playing with words that are comparable, we'll see connections that used to be there for all of us, which we tend to take apart and have as isolated. As I was talking to uh, Dale earlier about having the dots, but I couldn't connect the dots. I'm going to talk about that later when I talk about a book she lent me. It's wonderful. Uh, but, uh, okay, we have the dots, but we don't have the connection between the dots so often. Uh, so your faith has saved you. And notice, go in peace. Do you see why? Okay, if it brings peace and serenity, it's from God. All right. Uh, any comment or question before we uh, sort of go through chapter 8 real quickly? Uh, to the point, okay. Uh, now as we begin <coughs> in chapter 8, we have uh, a, we have the women and uh, we have great crowds. Uh, he's, Jesus is preaching and here's one of the Parables that all three of the of the three synoptic gospels have, and that's the uh, parable of the sower. You remember this: uh, seed is strewn, and some falls on good ground, and so on. Some not so good. And uh, now, I want you to notice what uh, Jesus draws from that. I uh, he explains to his disciples the parables, right? The parable. You remember this? <clears throat> okay. I'm going to read verse 17. Nothing is hid that shall not be made manifest, nor anything secret that shall not be known and come to light. Take heed then how you hear, for to him who has will more be given, and from him who has not even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. What does he mean? Take heed how you hear. Take it to heart. Understand in order to take it to heart, yes. Notice, for to him who has, more understanding will be given. From him who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. So where does that put that person that he's taken away? Outside of... Jesus doesn't say here, and so I don't know how to say, how to respond to the question, Dan. Uh, fair enough. Uh, and then, uh, that, then the occasion, and keep in mind this, uh, what, what's going on here. Who is Jesus? Okay, and the understanding of Jesus, and the understanding of what Jesus is all about, right? because that's who Jesus is, what he's all about. Okay, notice they say your mother and your uh, brothers are here. And what does Jesus say? He says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear. Notice what he's just said? Take heed to what you hear. Be careful about what you hear. Pay attention to what you hear. Notice that the ones who hear the words of God and the word of God and do it. Hearing, be not hearers only, the scripture says, but doers of the word. Questions or comment here? What is Jesus saying about his family?
Who is the family of Jesus? Everybody. Not everybody. All those, those who are hear and act. All those yeah. who hear and live the faith that Jesus is conveying. Is he minimizing his mother and brothers here? No. Not at all. He's just saying, you need a new understanding of who your family is. So, if we bring that into modern terms, who's his family? Those who hear the word and do it. And so those who don't hear it are not of his family? And there's mercy? That's correct. But where does mercy come into it? Um, anytime they <clears throat> ask for forgiveness, there is mercy. And those that don't know Jesus because there's no fault of their own, is there, is there um, a family? According to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, those who follow their best lights, <clears throat> God will hear. And he, then it goes on to say, we, i.e. we Catholics, are bound by the church. God is not. Well, I guess I remember too, he said that, you know, it uh, uh, deals with the sheep herder, I think. He has more than just one flock. And yes, he does say that. He also says, uh, oops, I just lost it. Oh, uh, he says, uh, he who is not against me is for me, is with me. Interesting. And he didn't, think, think of the gospel according to Matthew. Does uh, Matthew 25 say you have to ask for forgiveness? It says, I was hungry. He gave me food. I was thirsty. And so on. Do you follow? It doesn't say just my disciples, does it? Does it say those who follow me? Well, in a sense, to do what I do. But Okay, so uh, interesting that um, I think we are very much influenced by our Protestant. We live in a Protestant area, and we're very much influenced <coughs> by our Protestant. Notice what I'm going to say, and I'm saying it deliberately. We're very much influenced by our Protestant brothers and sisters. Do you know what Vatican II said about uh, Christians who follow other traditions? They are our separated brothers and sisters. Okay, family, if you will. They may not think we're family, but we need to think that they are. Okay. Believe it or not, I think we'll read. <laughs> uh, um, Mary Stevermer, are you up to being picked on today? Oh, sure. All right. Start with verse 22. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, Let us cross to the other side of the lake. So they set sail, and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A squall blew over the lake, and they were taking in water and were in danger. They came and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. He awakened, rebuked the wind and the waves, and they subsided, and there was a calm. Then he asked them, Where is your faith? But they were filled with awe and amazed and said to one another, Who then is this who commands even the winds and the sea? And they obey him. The healing of the Gerasene, Gerasene. Gerasene demonia. When, when they, then they sailed to the territory of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. 
When he came ashore, a man from the town who was possessed by demons met him. For a long time, he had not worn clothes. He did not live in a house, but lived among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. In a loud voice, he shouted, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had ordered the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It had taken hold of him many times, and he used to be bound with chains and shackles as a restraint. But he would break his bonds and be driven by the demon into deserted places. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, Legion, because many demons had entered him, and they pleaded with him not to order them to depart to the abyss. <clears throat> a herd of many swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him to allow them to enter those swine, and he, and he let them. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herds saw what had happened, they ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside. People came out to see what had happened, and when they approached Jesus, they discovered the man with whom the demons had come out sitting at his feet. He was clothed and in his right mind, and they were seized with fear. Those who witnessed it told them how the possessed man had been saved. The entire population of the region of Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were seized with great fear. So he got into a boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had come out begged to return to remain with him. But he sent him away saying, return home and recount what God has done for you. The man went off and proclaimed throughout the whole town what Jesus had done for him. I'm gonna stop you here, Mary, because I, I think there's a good deal to talk about. Have, did you notice certain words that were repeated in this passage? Fear. Fear. What really so often disrupts our lives and uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> removes the calm of our spirits? Fear. Uh, fears of all sorts. I, I, sometimes, <laughs> I sometimes think fear is the original sin. It can cause people to do incredibly cruel and human things. Uh, and of course, what is the statement that we hear from Jesus again and again? Fear not, be afraid. Fear not, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Okay. But what about those people that aren't in fear and they just do it deliberately? I'm sorry? What about those people who are not in fear and they just deliberately cause people grief? Well, I, uh, how, do, how do we know whether they're in fear or not? Uh, so, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know how to read what causes someone else to do something, really. So, uh, okay, he got in the boat. Now, does this seem strange to you that he would say, to, to the winds, uh, calm winds. Here again, I'm going to give you a word. This is again Hebrew, Greek, pneumonia, mm -hmm. uh, and this is Latin. And what do all three of those words mean? Ear, yeah. pardon? Ear, breath, <coughs> breath. <coughs> breath. Oops. Breath. I'll show you how you can recognize our uh, 
taking that word into English. Spirit, okay, we speak of God, they're talking about spirit and spirits, right? <coughs> if you are inspired, what? Yeah, you can't the spirits spirit. within you. Yeah, the spirit, there's a spirit that you're, uh, we usually say inspired by God, okay? What happens if you expire? Yeah. Yeah. Your breath goes out. <clears throat> Do you see what I mean? Inspire, expire. So you can see how we get that. We, see, I told you, we break everything up into parts. And we lose the connections. But then we get a bigger picture, don't we? Uh, and we get a smaller picture. Mm -hmm. We get a bigger picture yeah, about a little. We get parts. We get the parts. Uh, as I like to mm -hmm. say, we get the dots, mm -hmm. but we don't know how to connect them. Mm -hmm. We disconnect things. We disconnect things, mm -hmm. that's right. And now think about this. Okay, the breath within us, the breeze outside, not a storm wind. Remember the whispering sound of the wind by Elijah? Okay, the breeze outside, the breath within me, and the spirit of God, our spirits, in some sense, they're all one. By the very fact that I have breath within me means that I have something of God inside of me. Well, he made us from the, I like to use the word, he made us from the clods. <laughs> Some of us haven't come very far. Uh, but he made from the dust or the clods or clay of the earth. And then breathed into us the breath of life. The living breath. Spirit breath. Alright? So, notice when Jesus rebukes the wind, you can't rebuke the inanimate. I mean, that makes no sense. That's like a child uh, hitting something that hurt him because he said, that's a mean, you know, we, we've all seen that happen. Okay, so Jesus was not rebuking our concept of wind. He was rebuking his concept of wind and the concept shared by his people. The wind was alive in a sense. Could they be evil spirits? Sure. So he was rebuking evil spirits. Sure. Okay. Uh, is there any life in fire? Yeah. Can you take the oxygen or Well, now that's inanimate. Is there any life in fire? What about the burning bush? Yeah. What about the tongues of fire at yeah. Pentecost? What about the pillar of fire? Do you know the pillar of fire, the pillar of cloud yeah. in the Old Testament? Yeah. Do you know what the book of Exodus calls the pillar of cloud? The glory of God. The glory of God and even God himself. It's called the glory. Ah, in the book, the glory cloud. Right. Uh, so, glory of God and even God Himself. It's also called the cloud. Is also called the angel of God. Mm -hmm. So that cloud has a lot of stuff going on in it. The cloud is angel and a glory is that to us, the word glory is what? Abstract? 
Now, what's a glory? That doesn't make sense. Agreed? A glory in this tradition is either a radiance like fire or a heaviness like a cloud of fog. When the cloud settles over the tabernacle and over the temple, what would we call it? We wouldn't call it a cloud anymore. What would we call it? Pardon? Fog. Fog. <clears throat> Isn't that what fog is? Yeah. Cloud that come down. Yeah. So, uh, when a cloud settles over the tabernacle, notice Moses can't enter it. And when the cloud, when the temple is complete and the ark is brought in, what happens? A cloud fills the temple. We'd say fog. Okay, any question or comment? So notice, when Jesus rebukes the wind, he's rebuking <clears throat> spirits, a spirit. Okay, that leads us right into the next one. Mary, read in, uh, well, we, we remember that, don't we? The, uh, the, the, well, read it, Mary. And I'll just interrupt you as we go. Starting at 26. Oh, okay. Then they sailed. Oh, excuse me. Notice what the apostles ask. Who is this? Yeah. Who commands it? Who is that? Yeah. 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 The Remember I told you the question constantly is, who is Jesus? Okay, go ahead, Mary. Twenty-six. Then they sailed into the territory of Gerasenes, Ger Ger which is opposite Galilee. When he came ashore, a man from the town who was possessed by demons met him. For a long time he had not worn clothes. He did not live in a house, but lived among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. In a loud voice he shouted, What have you to, to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? God? Okay. Now, Jesus is in a thoroughly Gentile area now, not even a place where Jews live. And there's a man possessed by demons. Now, won't you notice, this man possessed by the demons is not a Jew. Pardon? He's a garrison. He's a garrison. Okay. <clears throat> and... What does he say to Jesus? What have you to do with me? Jesus, Son of the Most High God. What have I told you as we've gone through Luke? Who recognizes Jesus? Demons. The demons. <clears throat> and why does Jesus tell them to be quiet? He doesn't want everybody to know. Worse than that. <laughs> Who's Okay, if the demons recognize him, he must be. You gonna trust a demon to tell you the truth? Come on, right? Okay, and notice what the demon uses exactly the same words used in the Magnificat. Son of the Most High. Oh, no, no, that's not in the Magnificat. That's in the uh, Benedictus. The Son of the Most High. No, wait a minute. That's, I'm sorry, that's what the angel said to Mary at the Annunciation. He will be Son of the Most High. So, I get it. I was in the right neighborhood, just not in the right spot. Okay. Keep reading, Mary. Okay. I beg you, do not torment me. For he had ordered the unclean spirit to come out of the man. It had taken hold of him many times, and he used to be bound with chains and shackles as a restraint. But he would, but he would break his bonds and, would, and be driven by the demon into deserted places. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, Legion, 
because many demons had entered him. Do you know what the word legion is in uh, representative? It's a, again, it's a military term. It's the realm of legion. Okay, how many men make up a legion? 6,000. 6,000. <clears throat> I tell you, you've heard of people who were full of the devil? <laughs> 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 this guy is overflowing with the devil. All right? So if the devil just decided to leave without Jesus commanding him, the guy would be dead, wouldn't he? I don't know. No, I really mean that. I don't no, know. No, it doesn't say. It doesn't say. And uh, uh, is this man simply a demon? He's possessed by demons. He himself is not a demon. So I don't think we could say that he'd die if they left on their own. Uh, otherwise, how could Jesus would have had to raise this man from the dead? So, yeah. Okay. Mary, keep reading. He replied, Legion, because many demons had entered him, and they pleaded with him not to order them to depart to the abyss. Oh, uh, you know what the abyss is? Is used for, to represent? Space between heaven and hell? Uh, no. It's <clears throat> in, uh, this is in ancient Hebrew. Do you remember what the earth looked like in the, uh, when, uh, in the creation, how, what the conception was? Yeah. It was really, okay, and this is the earth was water and so on, and here underneath earth is what's Teham, the great deep. Remember when uh, the, uh, the, Noah, the flood of Noah, where did the water come from? Came from above and below. Okay, this is um, it, it's it's a, a kind of chaos. It's a restoration to the pre-created uh, world. In the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and the earth was without form, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Does that look like water? It's supposed to a puddle. Mm -hmm. And God, uh, I'm sorry, and the God created the heavens, the earth, the earth was without form, was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. Okay, that's this word right here. And so chaos. So if the demons were afraid of going back to that state, what does that mean? To a pre-created chaos. It was a pre-what? Pre-created chaos. So would that mean they would go back to nothing? Possibly. Uh, possi Notice they say the abyss. Jesus says, uh, no, who says the abyss? Uh, it, they say the abyss. And abyss comes to be another word for that below the earth. Uh, it's hard to get all these words quite connected because there's no place where they're laid out and defined. And so this, uh, anything I would say about it is guess. <laughs> yes. Well, and when the swines were drowned, <coughs> yet, then I didn't get the part of what happened to the evil spirits. Okay, I'll, I'll, come, I'll come back to that. Okay, keep reading here. <clears throat> a herd of many swine was feeding there on the hillside, and they pleaded with him to allow them to enter those swine, and he let them. The demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Okay, now, uh, first of all, do you know what a pig was 
to a Jew. Yeah, unclean. Unclean, uh, defiled. Uh, if a person is unclean or defiled, that doesn't mean he's dirty, though it could mean that too. But it means cast out completely. Sinful. Sinful goes with it. In fact, it's any kind of infirmity in some some way. Uh, so uh, the pigs were worthless animals to Jews. All right, so Jesus permits the spirits to go into the pigs, quote, worthless animals to him, to the Jews. So that's why, now, that's why when Peter had his dream when the pig was there, he was, oh, I boy, I never hate anything on clay. Yeah, that's right. I couldn't hear it again. What did you say? Well, when Peter had his dream at Cornelius' house, where it, all kinds of animals yeah, birds, yeah. that were open to eating. I can't eat an unclean drink. Right. Right. Okay. Now, uh, what happened to the? They did go into the abyss. Mm. Um, a great a the deep and an abyss. At, same word, really. Uh, so uh, they they did go into the abyss. I have a question. Yes. How, it seems like they often talk about um, the demons and people in scripture, but in our everyday world, it's pretty rare. So it, I just always notice we don't really have those types of things happening for us on our regular. It's possible we don't recognize when they happen, but for the most part, I think you're right. Well, uh, Harry Potter brought a lot of that back to our younger generation. Um, maybe, maybe not. That's controversial. And so, uh, the, the church's position on demon possession is this. There is such a thing. I mean, that's statement of the church. And every diocese is supposed to have a exorcist. Exorcist, thank you, I lost the word, so thanks. <laughs> uh, is supposed to have an exorcist. And when people feel, feel sometimes like something is wrong with them, they do actually go and ask for an exorcism. I, I relate to, I'm a nurse and I do healing touch and we, I do know that there are people who feel that something's clinging on to them, okay. that is not them. And, and, and but I also, I'm also aware that Michael the Archangel can dispel. So I, I don't know, maybe we all have some little part of us that can well, ask this clinging person I think, to leave. I think we, because we don't believe it, don't know about it, there are many, uh, there are many things going on within us that we don't recognize. Mm -hmm. But the position of the church is that no person against his or her will can be possessed. Mm -hmm. In other words, the movie exorcism is not not Catholic doctrine at all. No. And so uh, there are some cases that are said to be documented uh, examples of that. Mm -hmm. But that you're right, they seem to be rare. Mm -hmm. uh, and Exorcism would normally be done in private. This is not something for a spectacle. Mm -hmm. 
Am I responding? <clears throat> now, some are just yeah, saying there's an increasing number of people that are possessed. They're being. Uh, well, as I say, that's controversial. So, uh, but uh, it, in a way, it's not surprising. No. <clears throat> because uh, if there are people who are more inclined to something and are open to it, then. Yes, but uh, uh, as I say, I since the church deals with these things in private, I think for us to say how many or who or what would be, yeah. Okay, uh, now, uh, Mary, keep reading, verse 34. When the swineherds saw what had happened, they ran away and reported the incident in the town and throughout the countryside. People came out to see what had happened, and when they approached Jesus, they discovered the man from whom the demons had come out sitting at his feet. He was clothed and in his right mind, and they were seized with fear. Again, that word. Go ahead. Those who witnessed it told them how the possessed man had been saved. The entire population of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were seized with great fear. Again, that word. Go ahead. So he got into a boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had come out begged to remain with him, but he sent him away, saying, Return home and recount what God has done for you. The man went off and proclaimed throughout the whole town what Jesus had done for him. Okay. Do you realize what that demo uh, demoniac became, the Gerasene demoniac? Uh, a disciple. Mm -hmm. And even an apostle. He was sent. Apostle means one sent. Mm -hmm. He even became an apostle. Now, uh, especially where we live, Iowa, hog farms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> People read, we read that, and I've had people again and again say, how could Jesus do a thing like that? Well, economically, it'd be devastating. That's right. Uh, and, and at the same time, these people saw this man, and they asked Jesus to leave. So what do you value most? <laughs> apparently, <coughs> apparently some people do. well they were non-Jews they were not Jews so yeah, they did not, yeah. They yeah. Did not. But, but even non-Jews could recognize he was a man who was what remember he was naked and mm -hmm. he just could odd. break oh man uh, I wouldn't want to deal with him. I don't think any of us would. And uh, uh, so, uh, by the way, when you read things like that, you say, I, I've heard people say, oh, great mind. He couldn't do that. Well, have you ever heard of somebody picking up an um, automobile? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, when, uh, it's when, Something has happened. Somebody's under, and then they, um, and the what shall I say? The adrenaline, adrenaline of the moment. <clears throat> they pick up a, the car. So the guy, a person, or whatever, could be. So yeah, we. I think we we often dismiss things like that too easily. Yet, okay, coming back. I think this passage can be very difficult for some people to read because they, they say, what about their livelihood? Do you follow me? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd say, well, first of all, we've got to recognize that Jesus was a Jew. And second, what's more valuable? What I do to make a living of the life of a human being? That may seem like a stark choice, but uh, I wonder if our valuing how we survive ourselves does not 
keep us from what? Sharing what we have? Well, isn't it also like the abortion issue? Yeah, the woman uh, values her potential as a her an freedom earner, or whatever, uh, her vocation and stuff over the life of her child. And of course, that depends on the person. Right. Uh, but uh, in some cases, that seems to be true. And so, yeah, what do we value? Do we value a human life? And by human life, I mean any human being, any human being. I think if we hear, remember what, what's been said here today? What does it's been a focus? Heed what you hear, right? And I wonder how many of us heed what we hear. That's why we're sinners and go to confession. Uh, yeah, and too often I think we make that as an excuse. Yeah. Yeah. Who are you I'm just a I'm just a sinner. Okay, yes, I'm just a sinner, but that doesn't excuse me for anything. <laughs> oh, I believe it's that time, so shall we pray? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious, loving, forgiving, and merciful Lord, we thank you for this time together, and we pray that truly we may heed your word. Help us to have open ears and open eyes and open hearts. Help us to get your values clear so that they can be our values. May we, Father, recognize, yes, that we are sinners, but you called us to be saints. Show us the road and help us to have the strength and fortitude, the faith, the hope, the love in order to follow it. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Spirit.